you never know in life which decision is going to be your best. And you never know in life which indecision is going to be your last. We are at the end of our series on the feeding of the 5,000. Can you believe that we have spent eight weeks on the feeding of the 5,000? That um, doesn't surprise me at all because I think we could spend another six weeks on that. You're probably happy that we're moving on. I mean, Easter's in two weeks. So you probably know what's coming up. Uh, did you know Easter was two weeks, by the way? You knew that was just two weeks away. Is that correct? Just a couple of weeks, right? And then next week, you knew we were having breakfast together here at the church. You know, okay, just a, an announcement to make sure you're paying attention because food normally does. But this is the end of the eight week series on the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus' best friend, John, or one of his best friends, John the Baptist, was beheaded. Jesus went off to take some R&R &R with his disciples. The crowd followed him. Jesus ministered to them and wanted to feed them. He looked at Philip and said, how are we gonna feed them? And Philip said, we can't. We don't have the resources. He looked at Andrew and said, how are we gonna feed them? And he found a little boy and said, maybe we can, I don't know. So Jesus took the little boy, the crackers and the fish and looked up into heaven and gave thanks. He broke the crackers and the fish, gave them to the disciples. The disciples gave them to the people. And uh, the people ate and were satisfied. When they were done eating, there were 12 baskets full left over. And then we pick up today at the end of the story. We pick up with the crowd trying to decide what they were going to do about this miracle, what decision they were going to make about Jesus. And so I wanna just take you through some scripture that I think will help tie this up. It will put a period at the end of the sentence, well, at least of our series, and um, help you maybe draw some conclusions that I trust you've been working on over the last eight weeks. So let's look together here. We're gonna pick up sort of toward the end of this story. After the people saw the sign that Jesus performed, they begin to say, surely this guy's a prophet. Now they're not saying Jesus, they're saying prophet who's to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, knew that his time had not come. And so he withdrew again to a mountainside with his disciples. Now there's a great story here that you should read in your own Bible about getting across the lake um, and Jesus sending his disciples out and Jesus walking on water and then meeting up on the other side of the lake. And we're not gonna talk about that right now, but I wanna pick up on the other side of the lake. Jesus and his disciples were once again trying to get a little R&R &R, and the crowd found him. And so let's pick up here with the crowd finding Jesus. When they found him, they asked him, teacher, when did you get here? And Jesus said, I tell you, you're not really looking for me because you saw the miracles I performed, but because you got some stuff. And so he took them to a choice they have to make. And you and I have to make the same choice. The choice is this. Do you want to spend your life working for food that spoils, stuff that we leave behind, or for stuff that endures for eternal life? Jim Elliott was a missionary who was martyred about in the 50s um, in uh, Central or South America. And he had a quote or said a quote that has stayed with me actually since I was a child, a, a young boy. And he said, he is no fool who gives what he can't keep to gain what he can't lose. That it's not foolish to give up what you can't take with you, to gain what you can never lose after this life is over and we move on to the life beyond. So Jesus is taking the crowd to a diverging, a, a choice where they have to, a diverging path. Do I choose myself? my aspirations, my thoughts, my career, my achievements, or do I choose Jesus and his will and his plan? So they ask him, what must we do to be able to do these works that God requires? And Jesus said, the work is this, to believe in me. So they ask him, what sign will you give me that we may see it and believe? They wanted another sign. And then they went on to say, you know, we were been thinking and, you know, Moses gave his people some manna in the wilderness and maybe you could feed us again. And so Jesus said, stop thinking about food. You have to think about spiritual things. And he lays out a couple of concepts that are really important, but a little bit confusing. And so if we move on to the next slide here, you'll see that Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. At this time, the Jews began to grumble about him. And this is what they said. We knew you when you were a little boy. We know your mama is Mary and we know your daddy was Joseph. And there is no way you came from heaven. 
Now, sometimes it's really hard to minister to people who know us the best, isn't it? I remember in high school when we had had a long summer football practice and I was sitting there with all the, my friends, we were taking off our pads and sort of getting ready to, to leave. And one of the coaches started asking us what we were gonna do after we left high school. And everybody went around the room and kind of talked about what they were gonna do. And he got to me and he goes, Melick, what are you gonna do? And I said, I don't know, I may be a preacher. And everybody in the room laughed. They thought it was a joke. They thought it was hilarious because at the time, I wasn't living exactly like you would have expected somebody who says they wanna be a preacher would live. And my friends thought it was a joke. And so for me to have to go back to them and to be able to say, this is true, Jesus is real, I'm living a different way would have been challenging. But Jesus had been living the same way his entire life, yet the crowd still refused to believe. Now, the thing I wanna point you to is this crowd had chosen not to really make a decision about Jesus, but to keep putting it off, to keep deferring it, to keep thinking, to keep speculating, to evaluate. And they were out of time. Let's talk about this crowd just for a second. The crowd, Jesus did this miracle at Bethsaida. There was a triangle, a geographic triangle called the evangelistic triangle where Jesus did most of his ministry in the first couple years of his, of his public work. And there were three real cities here that were involved. One was Capernaum, which was Jesus' hometown after he and Mary and Joseph left Nazareth. The other one was Chorazin. And then the third one was Bethsaida. And they're all about six miles apart. And Jesus spent so much time there that everyone in that region, just a little six mile, six mile, six mile triangle, would have known who he was. Jesus did some miracles in Capernaum. And I'll just remind you of a couple of them. He healed the centurion's son. He healed the nobleman's son. He healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law. He helped the paralytic. He cast out the unclean spirit. He raised Jairus' daughter to life and he healed the woman with the bleeding issue all in Capernaum. But Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazon had chosen not to respond to Jesus. Now, I don't know why people choose not to respond to Jesus. I think there are different reasons. And you may have had your own reasons before you had responded to Christ, or maybe you have yet to respond to Jesus to become a follower and you're considering some reasons. And I know that people can have good reasons. There's just not a good enough reason for the decision not to follow Christ to be reasonable. And as I was thinking about this particular area, this triangle where they had seen Jesus and known him since he was a boy, heard him teach and watched him do miracles, I thought, what are some of the reasons these people could possibly not want to follow him? And really they represented just good church people who knew all the Bible stories, who'd been around, who liked the culture, who enjoyed you know, being superficial and nice on Sunday and knew how to talk and knew how to blend into the culture and like to talk about bless you and I'll pray for you and knew the right scriptures to drop at certain times. But they were the kind of people who at the end of their lives would go before Jesus and Jesus would say, why should I let you in? And they say, we did all these things in your name. And Jesus says, go away, I never knew you. And so I was thinking about some things and your things may be different. Maybe they were different. Some reasons that maybe people would choose not to follow Christ. Because this crowd was deciding not to follow Jesus at the point in time where it started to cost them something. Jesus had said, you can't continue to live your life for food. You can't continue to seek after your own way and your own plan. If you follow me, I'm going to take you a different path. And they saw that it was gonna cost them something. Now, he is no fool who gives what he can't keep to gain what he can't lose. And what it costs us pales in comparison to what we gain, make no mistake. But the cost is real. So real that Jesus in fact had said that a person's wise to count the cost before they come to him. Because those that don't, they don't stay. But there are some reasons. One, perhaps it was going to disrupt their God in a box religious life. You know anybody 
like that? Were you ever like that? Where you just had everything in a box or a compartment? Everything kind of fit. You had Sunday on Sunday and you had your friends that didn't really, you know, weren't a part of your Sunday life. And then you had your job and then maybe you'd show back up once during the week and then you'd come back on Sunday and check a box and everything just kind of fit. And Jesus came to smash the boxes that people had put God in. And it makes people uncomfortable because sometimes Jesus does uncomfortable things. Number two, they had to accept God's plan for their life over their own. And you and I both know this is scary because I had a plan for my life and you may have a plan for your life and you may know where you want to be next month, next year, five years, and you may very well be there, but you might not. And the might is what you have to give to Jesus. I might be here unless you tell me to do something else. And if you tell me to do something else, I will follow. That, my friends, is scary. But just because it's scary doesn't mean it's not true and doesn't mean it's not the best. Number three, they have to repent and live a different way. That We like to hang on to the sin that's in our life and, and not repent and, and let it go. And, and to follow Jesus wholeheartedly, you have to kind of put it behind you and ask forgiveness and live a different way. They had to choose to love those they didn't want to love. For this crowd, it would have been, as we talked about last week, the Gentiles who lived on the other area of the Sea of Galilee and the people who they felt were unclean and unfit. For you, who is it you don't want to love? How is it you don't want to love? This could have been a real roadblock for them coming to Christ, to forgive like Jesus forgave. Some people would rather hold on to unforgiveness even though it's a jail cell that dictates eternity for some, instead of receiving the free gift of Jesus Christ and choosing to forgive. To give when it doesn't make sense to give and to serve when they would rather be served. I don't know, but I do know that they were out of time. We all like to hear the words of Jesus when Jesus talks about grace and mercy and forgiveness and love and all those kinds of things that we're just so thankful for. All those things that make great sermons and make us feel good and, and wanna worship. But Jesus also says some really difficult things, some hard things that make us stop and think. And I don't want this to scare you unnecessarily because I grew up in a church and churches where the pastors oftentimes would literally try to scare the hell out of you. And I say that in a churchy way. All people are going to hell and they would try to scare you so that you weren't. See, it's okay to say it that way. They would try to scare you so bad that you would run down the aisle and make a decision and sign a card and maybe not even know what you're doing. And they would tell stories about people who leave the church parking lot and get hit by a bus and all kinds of things that happen. And while those things may be true, um, they were tactics. And that's not my heart and it's not our practice but just because what I'm gonna share with you is a little bit scary, doesn't mean that it's not true and it doesn't mean that I don't love you because friends tell friends the truth, even though sometimes it's scary and hard to hear. So Jesus, uh, a little while earlier, had already pronounced a judgment or a curse on these three cities, but he came back and did this huge miracle that impacted many of the people, 20,000, and there weren't that many people that lived in this little triangle to yet even give them one more, perhaps last chance. So these are the words that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11. He began to denounce the towns in which most of the miracles had been performed because they didn't repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So you hear what I'm saying? Jesus is saying that the things that I did around you and among you were so powerful that if I had done them in two of the worst cities in human history, they would have repented, but yet you chose to, to harden your hearts. And then he goes on to compare it to a city that all of you probably know. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment for you and you, Capernaum. Will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you're going to hell. For the miracles that were performed for you, if they'd been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment 
than it will be for you. And I think the message here is that at some point, Jesus can run out of patience. And at some point, you and I, we can exhaust our chances. That it's possible to harden our hearts toward the gospel in such a way that they stay hard until the day we die and there's no more time to make the choice to receive Christ. And I don't want this to be a downer and I don't want it to be unnecessarily scary, but there's an ominous warning that this path that Jesus has taken this crowd of 20,000 people to, who is it you say I am? And the crowd and their indecision was very likely to have cost them eternity. So we're gonna pick this up and we're gonna talk about it, put it in some context. And I'm gonna lay a challenge out for you in just a few minutes. Father, thank you for- so Let's pick up with the response of the Jewish people. And I wanna to read to you what I paraphrased for you earlier about how they, how they reacted to this amazing period in their life. Jesus declared to them, I am the bread of life and whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them and then I will raise them up at the end of time. Nobody can come to the father unless they're drawn. How does God introduce himself to someone? I can introduce myself to you. Hi, my name's Rick. What's your name? You tell me, we'd shake hands. We would become acquaintances. When I met my wife, Joy, um, it was not nearly as elegant, and it's one of my favorite stories, um, probably one of the lower moments of my life, but um, still one that I like to relive. Those who've been you know, with me for a while, I'm almost six years um, coming up here in a few months, uh, you've heard this story, and as we're together for a while longer, you'll hear the stories over and over again. That's what happens to pastors. We run out of stories, so we start repeating them. So if you've heard it, just chuckle along in a polite way. If you haven't, this really happened. When I met my wife, I'd never seen her before, had no idea she even existed. I was in college at Washita Baptist University, Arkadelphia, Arkansas, and I was very busy uh, meeting as many girls as I could my freshman year. So I was sitting on the steps of a dorm, um, a girl's dorm at about 11 o'clock, and they had a curfew back in the day, good old Baptist school. And I was very um, focused on the girl I was with, you know, trying my best moves, wanted to get a kiss on the cheek. It was a Baptist school after all, right? You gotta be careful. And so Joy, since I was on the steps, she was on another date and her date drove her up and said goodbye in the car and dropped her off. And she came walking up the, the stairs, you know, and, and uh, walking up to me. And I didn't even really look up. And she said, hey, what time is it? She was worried she was gonna miss curfew. I was annoyed that somebody was interrupting my best stuff. And so I just sort of looked up at her and just said, I said, buy a watch. Um, <laughs> those were my first words to my wife. I promise you that's true. It's, it's shameful, I know. Those were my first words to Joy. And you wonder why we're together. And the reason we're together is because she gave me a look at that point in time that was like a death look. It was like, I will crush you. And it captivated me and I began to stalk her. And 33 years later, we're still, still together. But introductions are not always elegant. And um, God introduce him, introduces himself to people. He said, what's that mean? Well, People don't have a natural ability to search for God. The Father has to draw them. So I wanna to talk to you about what that looks like, how God introduces himself to us. The Bible tells us that everyone is born sinful. In the book of Romans, the apostle Paul writes, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Adam and Eve started it, but I don't really blame Adam and Eve because I probably would have contributed to it had they not. And the reality of it is that 
we, when we're born into this life, are born sinful and destined to spend an eternity in hell without intervention from the divine power, God. The Bible says that all of us were born sinful and that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, the Apostle Paul talks about this in a little bit more detail. And the reality is that each of us, as we're born into this world, are born spiritually dead. And when I mean and say spiritually dead, I mean totally and completely spiritually dead. Let me show you here from a passage in Ephesians. The Apostle Paul says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and in your sin. And what this means is that as people who were spiritually dead, we were totally unable to respond, to even know, to even acknowledge that there is this potential of a personal relationship with God without God introducing himself to us first. And this is what I believe. I believe that every person who is born into this world will have at least one chance where the Holy Spirit of God nudges, whispers in the ear, quickens the heart of a person born spiritually dead like you and me and creates an interest, a spiritual interest or curiosity that in and of itself is a gift from God. And so it looks somewhat like this. We're born, we're spiritually dead. You've seen dead people. I don't mean to be morbid, but they're dead. They don't move, they don't respond. You can talk to them, they don't answer. You can poke them, it's not polite, but they do not respond to that either. And the Holy Spirit of God whispers in the ear of a spiritually dead person. And we have to choose whether we're gonna listen or whether we're not. And the problem is we don't know how many times the Holy Spirit's gonna whisper in the ear of someone who's spiritually dead. Because we are only, I believe, promised one opportunity to respond. But because of the grace of God, he often gives more opportunities to respond And for some people, these opportunities to respond and the curiosity and the interest could extend throughout this entire biological life until you leave it behind and you die. But we don't know that for sure. And for some, the opportunity to receive the free gift of salvation could be withdrawn and the person would never ever want it or think about it or have the chance again. And that's scary to me, but it's true. And I love you, but more important, God loves you. And he expressed this through Jesus as you were dead and your transgressions and sins, the way you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler and the, of, the, of the kingdom of the air who is at work in this world now and in those of us who are disobedient. He goes on to say, the apostle Paul, you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature. And it's not our fault, but we certainly are responsible. We contribute to it. It was not yet cut away. Then God made us alive in Christ when he forgave our sins. And he canceled the record of the charges against us. And he took it away by Jesus Christ being nailed to the cross. So there is a reality And the reality is this, Adam and Eve sinned, God responded. Because God was loving and merciful, God's heart broke. Because he was holy and just, he cursed humankind. So that everyone born from that point until Jesus comes again is destined to spend eternity in hell without intervention from God, without an introduction from God without a response from us. He doesn't force, he's gentle. It's often a whisper, a word. 
And then we're responsible to respond. And for those who respond because of God's love, the way he loved the world, that anyone who believes in Jesus won't perish, but can have eternal life. But the reality of this, and one of the points that this miracle punctuates so profoundly is it is nothing to play with because we don't know what day is our last and we don't know which chance is our last. We do know some things for certain. In Hebrews, we see, and also in Corinthians, the writer of Hebrews says, just as people are destined to die once, after that, we face judgment. Now, I wanna make sure that you understand that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life Nobody comes to the Father except through me. But anyone who wants to come to the Father can come through Jesus. But the only way is through Jesus. And the only way is by receiving this invitation or extension that God initiates as he meets us eye to eye and quickens us in our interest or our heart and gives us the desire to say, yes, I will follow. Yes, I will choose you to be a disciple. Once you make that decision, you never lose it. The Holy Spirit himself seals it and guarantees it. But we're responsible to choose. And so I don't wanna move past this point right now without making sure because I love you. And because I love you, I wanna make sure I'm clear I wanna make absolutely sure that every person here, all of you, my friends, and everyone watching online who sees this, takes this seriously, realizes that even today you've been brought to a diverging trail, to a choice that may have permanent and eternal consequence. And I wanna ask you if you've decided to follow Jesus. To make that decision it's a relatively simple thing to do. You tell him and you say something like this. And you don't have to say it out loud. You say it in your mind, in your heart. God's installed in you a thinker where you connect and communicate with him. You say, look, I know I've sinned. I know I've fallen short. One, a thousand, forgive me of my sins, God. You tell him, I believe who Jesus is. I don't know everything. I don't have a PhD. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a seminary student, but I believe who Jesus is. He's your son who came to earth and lived a perfect life and took on my sin to pay the price for my sin. He was nailed to the cross with him. He rose again three days later, defeating sin, Satan and death once and for all. I believe that, however you want to say it. And I choose to follow you. Here it is, my life, everything. Now this is where that rubber hits the road. Sometimes we come with prenuptial agreements. Sometimes we write fine print into the contract. And Jesus says, if you come, you come. All of you, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think that's Clint Eastwood, not Jesus, but it still applies here. You come, all of you, and I receive all of you as you are. You can't fix yourself. You can't straighten up. You can't live right. You come like you are. And then Jesus does the rest. So have you made that decision? If you haven't, I want you to do it today. If you don't know how to do that, I want you to grab Pastor Dan or myself, Pastor Jared or Brandon, right after church, we're around. Just grab us and say, hey, explain this a little bit more. I wanna make this decision. If you're watching online, there's contact information where you can reach out to one of the pastors and we will respond to you. It's our favorite thing to do, to be able to talk to you about this. Now, let's move on. We're gonna land this plane. The disciples, all right? The disciples are still there. The 12, and then a few more that are like, yeah, we think we're in, but we're not 100% sure. Let's look at the disciples and let's get there here pretty quickly. Um, on hearing this, these hard truths, Jesus saying he's from heaven and the Jews saying, no, you're not. You're from, Naz or from Capernaum. We know your parents. On hearing this, many of the disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that the disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, do I offend you? 
from this time, many of the disciples, not the 12, but the ones that are kind of, yeah, I think I'm in, they turned back and no longer followed Jesus. And then Jesus looked at the 12 and he said to them, do you want to leave too? Can you imagine the tension in this moment where Jesus is looking at the 12 and he said some hard things. In this passage, read it for yourself. There's some stuff we skip because we don't have time. He said a lot to hear. And he looked at them and he said, are you gonna leave too? And then Simon Peter, of course, spoke up for the group. And he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Correct grammar and everything. Where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. So here are the disciples. This is awesome. Jesus asked this question to the crowd. Who is it you believe that I am? And they're like, meh, we're not, a, we're not sure. He asked this question to the disciples and the disciples made a decision. They made a decision nobody else appeared to be making. We live in a world right now in a society where it appears that many more people are, are choosing not to follow Christ than at any other time in my lifetime, which for me is opportunity, but there's also tragedy. But in Jesus' day, it was no different. There was a handful who said yes and a crowd that said no. And they made a decision that nobody else appeared to be making because they weren't interested in following the crowd. They were following Jesus. They were still a little bit confused. You don't have to know all the answers, friends. I don't know all the answers and I've been studying probably a little longer than some of you. You don't have to know it all. You just have to believe what you know. It was really inconvenient for these disciples. Do you know that more than a handful of disciples, they were from Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazin? These were their people. They were their friends. They were their parents' friends. And they were literally choosing to go against the flow of their people. It was inconvenient for them and there was really no way back but they believed that it was real. They said, Lord, to whom shall we go if not to you? And it led us where we are today. Jesus did not use social media influencers, politicians, or powerful people to shape the world that we live in and to shape the world back then. He used and uses disciples. And the disciples' response to Jesus is the reason that you and I are here sitting in a church service like this right now, so many years later. So what you do and how you're involved and take responsibility for your own personal response to the gospel and the people close to you has ripples that last for generations. And this miracle that we've spent eight weeks on is ended with an exclamation point that rings thousands of years later. So let's end this with a challenge and a statement. Who do you believe Jesus is to you? How do you know which decision will be your best? The disciples didn't. Which indecision might be your last? Father, thank you for today and I thank you for the last eight weeks the way you've spoken to us, the way you've challenged me personally as really every week, Lord, I've learned something else about this amazing story and you've revealed something else to me that I need to work on. And I know that you're doing that with my friends as well. And I pray that today would not be lost on my friends who are here in this room and also listening online. That as you're drawing people to us or to, to yourself through us, through your word, through faithful believers who take responsibility and interest in those who you put in their lives, I pray that they would respond, that they would decide, that they would become followers of Jesus, just like those 12. And as we let these things settle in our heart and we move on to different things, different sections of scripture and different themes, 
that we would not forget what you have done and are doing for the last eight weeks that we've invested together. We look at you, Father, and we believe, not knowing everything, but knowing you. We trust that your way is the right way, that your plans are perfect, and that your love for us never fails. So even though we fail, even though we are imperfect, and even though we are weak, we give ourselves to you each day, each week, to be used by you for your purpose, to be a light in a dark world. Thank you for choosing us and for the promise of heaven that waits on the other end of this life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.